Welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast, your source for information on hunting, fishing, and all of your outdoor passions. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shields Outdoors podcast. My name is Mike Anderson, and we are at Shields Fishing University in Chamberlain, South Dakota, on the edge of the Missouri River. For those of you wondering what a fishing university is, it's a Shields Associate Training where vendors, pro staff, guides, and tournament fishermen come to offer a crash course in rods, reels, electronics, new lures, basically all things fishing. There's classroom training and then there's on the water training where Shields Associates get hands-on training with all these products and bring back that knowledge to the stores in an effort to give the best possible service to any customer that steps into the fishing department. We end each night with seminars from some big name speakers, and it just so happens that we have one of them with us for this podcast segment. With me today is John Hoyer, who's going to be giving a seminar on life of a pro angler. John, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into fishing? Uh, sure, thanks for having me, Mike. Um, I got into fishing probably like a lot of people, um, definitely with a night crawler and a bobber off a dock for bluegills. And, you know, I guess that was probably when I was three or four years old and then probably made the normal progression to catching a bass that fought a lot better and, you know, was bigger. And uh, from there, um, my dad moved our family to Brainerd, Minnesota. So I think that's when I had my first kind of walleye encounter. And, you know, from there, it was just kind of... Uh, you know, once I was old enough to take my dad's boat to the lakes, um, while I was kind of my primary focus, but I really, I think from the get go, I really enjoyed fishing for everything. So, um, that's definitely how I got my start, you know, just fishing. Okay. And it, what is it that has kept you hooked? Um, really, uh, I like to kind of quote a saying that I heard at some point, but it's basically like, you know, a, a man fishes or a person fishes their entire life and then they realize it's not the fish they're fishing for. So, um, you know, I think part of my musky fishing career or whatever, and now, you know, as tournament angler fishing, you know, walleye tournaments, et cetera, et cetera, I realize that really my favorite part of fishing isn't actually catching anything. It's just like the anticipation before you catch something or before you catch a trophy where, you had it on your calendar to go to the rainy river in the spring and you bought the jig heads and the plastics and made the booking at the lodge and you got your boat ready and you drove up with your friends and it was inclement weather and you drop your jig down and six hours go by and then you catch your 28 incher. So as I look back at what really drives me, um, it's really, it's the anticipation of, you know, catching quality fish in a tournament or my biggest fish ever and, you know, it's all the travel and the camaraderie around that, actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said that really well. It's just there's there's so much that goes into getting that bite, just all the all the preparation and the the anticipation. Almost the, the anticipation could be better than the actual bite. <laughs> I, I mean, it is for me, but I also have the luxury of fishing so much, you know, where, um, you know, reeling a fish in is actually really hard work. But uh, I heard an Al Linder uh, seminar one time at MPA conference and he, you know, put it just black and white. Like what everybody's looking for is just something to pull on your line. And, you know, that's obviously what got us all excited about fishing. But, um, I kind of say it loosely and joking, but in reality, you know, man, that's hard work. You know, I don't want to catch a hundred fish in a day, but you know, I want a little bit of a challenge. I want there to be some lulls and, um, you know, then have some success. Mm -hmm, absolutely. You know, that kind of caters to the musky fishing. So is, is that kind of why you, you got so excited about musky? Oh yeah. A hundred percent. Um, you know, when I started musky fishing was right when Minnesota was like peaking in all their initial stockings. So, um, it was kind of like jumping right into like, you know, these amazing fisheries that had 50 inches, you know, swimming in them and you could have a really good chance of catching one right off the bat. So, um, you know, it was right about in the induction of the, uh, the musky mayhem cowgirl, which is, you know, a bucktail that pulls like a, like if you were to cast a drift sock in and try to reel it in, you know, and 
I was physically fit, you know, in my early twenties and right away, I just started realizing that like the amount of men or the amount of physical strain I'd put on my body just to have a follow or to have a bite and maybe catch one was unbelievable. And it really kind of spoke to what makes a muskie so great. Well, you know, 10, 12, 15 years later of muskie fishing, it's back to what we just talked about. It's, you know, it's not even that it, it's the bite, but it's literally like right as that bite's happening, just justifies your five days without a bite, your two weeks with only one bite, you know, and, um, for a fish to be able to do that to any person. And it, it does it to a lot of people, you know, anyone who musky fishes knows what I'm talking about. But, um, that really gave me like this utmost respect for muskies, which are the epitome of anticipation. That's all they are. That's what you're doing all the whole time is just anticipating getting bit by the biggest fish in freshwater. Mm-hmm, absolutely. They're called the fish, a 10,000 casts for right. a reason. So, um, you know, what really got you, you know, just so dedicated into it where you'd spend like almost the entire season strictly devoted to musky fishing? Um, really for me, you know, there's musky fishing, there's different types of musky fishing, but for myself, it was having those follows and really having those follows. Um, you know, if you're using a soft plastic bait or something that's not a bucktail, uh, an erratic bait, you know, you get to see bites periodically right at the boat where they just come up out of nowhere and bite it. But, um, really what got me super hooked on it was throwing a bucktail, reeling it as fast as I could, and then watching that fish engage and quickly learning that there was moves and there was timing to those moves that could turn that following fish into just this ravenous animal and have it just destroy your bucktail at the boat. And it was so challenging that learning curve because inevitably you don't get a lot of reps or you don't get a lot of follows in a day. Um, so you're kind of just building off your last one. And then there's this scenario where here's your opportunity. Here's this 50 inch or here it comes. And do you really want to take your bait away from it really fast? Like it's right behind it. But, um, that was one of my biggest lessons in fishing is like, you know, learning that if I could make my bait react to the presence of the fish and take it away like a fleeing bait fish, um, that fish that would usually just follow it around using as little effort as possible and maybe just nip my bucktail, I could manipulate it and turn it into a fish that would um, come unglued, go top speed, and then eat it like you see on the Discovery Channel when a great white eats a seal from underneath, like an absolute death crunch. And that's what got me absolutely hooked on musky fishing. It was like, all that effort was just to get one of those follows on a bucktail and then make it bite on a figure eight really hard. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, makes me sore just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> makes me excited thinking about it though. I mean, like I've been, I've been musky fishing a few times, caught a few, like never to your devotional level, but just like when you're, when you're running a top water or like a bucktail just under and you see that tail following behind it, like, Oh man, that's just intense. How do you, how do you keep your composure and like develop your thought process on, on how to get that fish to engage? Um, you know, one of the things I learned early on in musky fishing was just to, you know, expect to have a follow each cast. So, um, you know, a lot of, um, musky fishing is all about being like, how many hours can you fish? So there's a lot of different things that you can do mechanically to have the least amount of strain on your body. Um, but then in my mind, as I had done seminars and stuff, I would talk about like, okay, you're in autopilot mode. The majority of the time you might be coming to sunset when you think you're going to get bit, but every cast involves the smallest amount of effort possible, but you need to like accelerate your bait to the boat and then do a good figure eight, at least, you know, half of a turn of a figure eight. So, um, really that was, uh, where when you started expecting to have those follows, then all of a sudden there was one there, you're already kind of in that proper mindset. And then again, as I said, you know, once I learned that taking my bait away at the right time was the move that was going to increase my chances of having that fish bite. Um, it was just kind of a calming thing. So, um, that was on a day-to-day basis. I mean, there's always this big adrenaline kick up, you know? Um, but in reality, I think my second full year of musky fishing, I was already fishing musky tournaments and, you know, 
having muskies bite in a figure eight in a muskie tournament, that is the highest level of excitement and needed composure in all of fishing. Like there's times where I got a fish that was coming in moderate fast or moderate. And by the seventh or eighth time around a figure eight, I had the thing going warp speed, but it still hadn't bit. And at that point, you're flirting with the top of the water on the high outside turn of your figure eight and you blow your bucktail out of the water and that's just game over. You don't catch that fish. But, um, that was kind of my initial training. It was like trial by fire, you know? So, um, but that was really kind of the mindset that would like calm me down and be able to stay composed, you know? Mm -hmm. Can you dive a little bit further into like, take your bait away? What do you mean exactly by that? Yeah. So, um, a muskie's at the top of the food chain and it knows it. Like anyone who's seen a muskie sitting there, like it's sleeping or has seen this big muskie follow in a lure and then just turns off nonchalant at the boat. Um, what's happening there is like the part that they know they're at the top of the food chain so they can eat whatever they want, whenever they want. And I think that's the attitude. That's why they're the fish of 10,000 casts because in nature they sit out on a prime spot there's perch, there's walleyes, there's bass, there's tulabies. You know, they have options to eat stuff, mostly at will, I would say. So, um, you know, as you see that fish acting like that, that's where you need to, like, play to their, um, I guess it would be called human nature, uh, animal instincts. So um, at no point, I think, in their normal day-to-day of eating a any type of bait fish, is that fish just going to be sitting there and not get away, you know, so if that perch uh, knew that that muskie was swimming up on it, it's not going to sit there and let it eat it. So that's basically, in essence, what your slow-moving bait where the fish is following right behind it represents. And what you see is that kind of cockiness of that muskie is they're just not sold. Like, you're not doing what I'm used to. You need to be getting away. So when I say take the bait away, you know, a lot of times in our Minnesota lakes, you can see a follow happening from, um, you know, maybe 10, 12, 15 feet out from the boat you know, even further if your bait's high in the water column. And what's going on there is they've already closed in on the gap and they haven't eaten it. So they're not sold. And that's where you need to like add speed to the equation. So if you're burning a bucktail as fast as you can on the surface, you can't go any faster um, until you get to the boat and you can start controlling it with your rod. And that's the only time you can add speed. Otherwise your bait will blow out of the water. Um, So when I say take it away, that fish is right behind it, not sold, not sold. Now I come to the boat, dive it down really fast, change the direction, add speed down to my right. The fish takes off after it all of a sudden. It's like, whoa, you're, you think you're going to get away? And then you, you know, double back on it and you go high outside and then you kind of hang it up there. And what happens is that's when their instinct takes over. And they're, um, it's definitely a normal bait fish move and not to ramble on the subject, but it, you can tell it gets me really excited. But um <laughs> you know, five years ago, I saw it in saltwater where I had this blue runner on five pound blue runner. I'm reeling it in. There's a bunch of sharks around and all of a sudden here comes this like nine foot shark and I'm fighting this blue runner on light tackles. So I can't really control it. And all of a sudden it darts over. Uh, it was actually my friend, Paul Hartman who was reeling on it, but I was videoing it. It darts across the bow of the boat and the shark comes flying after it. And then this blue runner does this corkscrew from like 15 feet down and it just corkscrews to the surface I remember watching that nine foot bull shark just snapping at it. It missed it like three times, all the way up to almost the surface. And then the blue runner takes off on a straight line. And it literally looked like that bull shark vacuumed that thing in from like eight feet away. It just went boom, accelerated, and the thing was just gone. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's exactly, you know, um, what your bucktail is impersonating is that last resort of a lot of bait fish is to flee back over that predator's body, outmaneuver them basically. So, um, you know, putting science behind it and everything, kind of making your figure eight do that by going down deep and then doubling back over its head. Um, when you start seeing those bone crunching strikes, you know, then you know you're onto something. So um, that's really kind of the, the whole essence of taking your bait away And then you take it away, you see them kick their tail down, and then you hang it back over their head, and you actually slow it down. And that's where they can't help themselves, because that's their chance. Um, And it must be, again, in nature where, okay, I doubled back over the thing's head. Now I slow down because I thought I got away. And then old wise muskie just turns and lunges, hence the name muskelunge, lunges and eats that thing, you know, from like three or four feet away. So 
if you want to simplify it in your musky fishing, if a bait, if a fish is ever within 12 inches or two feet of your uh, 12 inches of your bait or closer, you need to add speed. You need to get away from it. Um, most good musky bites are literally going to happen from, you know, two, three, four feet away is when they'll commit, they'll lunge your bait. So, um, when I'm watching a fish in my figure eight, reading its mood, I'm just kind of, I keep re- repeating the same scenario where I go high outside over their head. I see how fast they're coming up to the bait. If it, is, if it doesn't happen in a split second, um, I'm already deciding I'm going to take it into the next turn of my figure eight, maybe let it get a little closer, take it away. And then all of a sudden, you know, when it's right, you're going to see them start getting more and more aggressive. Maybe by the third or fourth time around, you saw it kick its tail, you saw it pop its gills. And that's kind of that last resort where it's like, I'm speeding it away. I'm going to hang it on the last turn and really just slow it down and hold it up there. And about 99% of the time, that's like their green light. Like then they'll just shoot up and eat it. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah. I am so glad I asked that question about take the bait <laughs> it's, away. Cause it's I deep. expected, <laughs> yeah, that got really deep, but it was really, really good. Awesome information there. Um, so what are, what are your favorite types of tactics when you're doing musky fishing? Um, well, again, I mean, I'm fishing for anticipation, you know, so, um, bucktail by far my favorite one, because that's the only, the, um, people ask like, you know, I had a follow on a glide bait, you know, what can I do to catch on a figure eight? There's nothing you can do. There's not much you can do on a, um, Medusa or a bulldog or any erratic bait. What happens is it's erratic, the whole cast, and then it comes in and starts swimming in a straight line and going around a circle. They're just like, no, we're, I'm not sold on that, you know? Um, so by far my favorite is, you know, a bucktail, because if I can just get a follow on a bucktail, I'm confident that, you know, I can raise my odds by doing that figure eight I was just talking about and getting one to bite. So um, my whole musky career, I've always leaned on bucktails just because those are the ultimate figure eight bait. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, before we started this, you were talking about topwater strikes. Well, another great thing to get you into musky fishing is seeing that, you know, tail come up behind the bait. It's almost like another shark thing where they're following behind it. And, um, you know, they either end up eating it or they'll come to the boat and you can kind of change direction and you can get some amazing boat side strikes on top waters. So, um, you know, bucktails, then top waters. And I, maybe just the gratifying part, like number three would be a rubber bait, a Medusa or a bulldog. And um, just the gratification of like really knowing how that lure works, knowing the dive curve of that lure, um, working it really aggressively in the summer, or just like slow and <clears throat> steady or subtle in the fall. But, you know, getting one of those bone jarring bikes on a big rubber bait, um, those are unforgettable strikes, you know, and inevitably my biggest fish of my life, you know, have come on Mille Lacs in the fall where I'm literally looking for one bite in like two weeks and I've had those bites and I can fish for 14 days without a bite. But when it happens, that is like the highest of highs. That's like the peak of the musky mountain is to get bit on Mille Lacs in November, you know, on a pounder bulldog. And because when your line goes tick and there's that split second before you set the hook and you come tight and maybe even another 10 or 15 seconds before you get a really good idea how big it is, um, that's like the epitome of anticipation for myself. And obviously anyone who puts them through that living hell that is like Mille Lacs in the fall. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> oh cool so um you know you, you've had made kind of a transition now with your fishing you, know, you spent a ton of time musky and now you've started doing the you know the professional tournament trail you know walleye and bass how is how is what you learned with musky fishing translated to uh you know translated to walleye fishing and translated to bass fishing um i mean whether it's freshwater or saltwater, um, you know, really at any level there's predators, you know, maybe a bluegill is the only thing I don't consider like really a predator unless they get big, but you know, everything, it's a fish eat fish world. So anything that eats other fish is going to have a similarity to a muskie to some point. So, um, all that stuff we just talked about, I really give a lot of credit to, you know, the successes I've been lucky, fortunate enough to have, the blessings I've had in walleye tournaments are really a lot of that is like baselined by what I just talked about. You know, so if I make a cast for a walleye, which is my favorite thing to do, um, you know, and say I saw 10 of them on my side imaging over there, 
I always constantly have a picture of a fish following my bait. And um, there was actually a little turning point in that thought process too for myself. Corey Springle, who I used to travel with as a co-angler, showed me a video of, um, of him pulling a spinner rig on Green Bay. And if you know anything about Corey Springle, uh, if you're listening to this, I'm sure you do. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Cause we, we just had him on. A oh, podcast. really? Okay. There yeah. you go. He, he said that, uh, he takes all the credit of, of your fishing success. hundred you know? percent he does. <laughs> so hopefully he listens to this so he can hear me giving him a hundred percent of my, uh, credit due. Right. Okay. So, um, Corey Sprangle is like the best great Lakes spinner fisherman of all time. So simple spinner night crawler. Right. And before he showed me this video, I had this picture in my head of him trolling and kind of acting like a, like a shop vac going over a reef on green Bay, like catching every walleye that's on that spot. Well, he showed me this video and, um, he had like 10 walleyes on the video and they'd swim right up behind a spinner. It had a water wolf camera and out of like 10 of them, only two or three of those walleyes bit. The others, other ones would swim right up behind it, almost like a muskie following a bucktail. And then they'd turn off. Some of them would come back, um, but only like a couple of them bit. And they really just kind of shot up out of nowhere and bit it. Um, so that was like this huge light bulb in my head where I was like, man, you know, there isn't, it's not just muskies that aren't sold on these big dumb lures that we're throwing, you know. Walleyes a lot of times aren't sold either, and they follow just like muskies. So, um Obviously, that changed a lot of the way I viewed trolling, but it really gave me that green light when I was casting for walleyes. And same thing that I did when I musky fish. And I was like, picture a fish following my bait. You know, that would maybe I'd add a speed burst halfway in or something like that. But um, that's kind of the essence of what I do when I'm casting for walleyes. You know, have the confidence that a walleye is following your lure. That might mean a lure switch, um, maybe a different color, different style, whatever. But for me, a lot of that is just the first thing I want to do is to try some different types of presentation, different things I do with my rod, more aggressive, more subtle, et cetera, et cetera, just experiment. So um, that's the number one thing that's crossed over for me from muskies into walleye fishing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's an interesting thought process too. You know, like a lot of people that want to go, you know, pull spinners and just drift or, you know, sitting there, put it in a rod holder, just, you know, kind of sit kicking back and, and just letting it pull in. But it's, it's very interesting to think about what's actually happening, happening below the surface, how many walleyes are actually following your bait, but not committing. And it's like, Oh, if I switch up my presentation a little bit, like, what could have happened. Right. And like we, we are in the golden age of walleye fishing right now. I mean, there's a bunch of companies, um, you know, Berkeley's one of my sponsors. If you guys want to tune out what I'm about to say, I, I hear you, but, uh, <laughs> you know, they have been putting these baits in our hands that allow us to fish way more aggressively. And I've done a podcast before where they're asking me about like, who taught me fishing? Well, my dad falsely taught me back in the day, learning from the guides of the Brainerd Lakes area, you know, and the Linders and uh, Doug Stangy and all those guys were living around there and guiding and everything, um, you know, that walleyes are really finicky biters. Um, you need the lightest line, you know, stealth, the lightest line, smallest hooks, freshest bait you can possibly get. And that is a huge misconception of what a walleye is. A walleye is as efficient of a predator as a muskie. That's why you feel that tick when they bite it. Just like a muskie, um, pike aren't in this category. Pike, they they use an over amount of energy to eat your bait. That's why you feel your line go slack. They're not as efficient. Where a muskie will lunge and stop right when it eats something, uh, you'll feel that big tick or thump. Same thing with a walleye. They're absolutely efficient predators, and they're every bit of a predator that a walleye is. So now, in the last like ten years, I mean, for instance, think about, you know, the first time that I saw somebody use a jig wrap. Okay, well, ice fishing a jig wrap was kind of a slow, subtle thing, you know. Um, a fish would come in, you'd kind of just turn it into, like, come eat my minnow head. But, you know, watching somebody jerk that aggressively and then catch a walleye out of a boat on it, that was one of the first things. Well, now, um, you know, whether it's a half-ounce jig and a champ swimmer, a snap jig that's going left or right two or three feet, um, trolling crankbaits at a faster speed, um, you know, using a rattling bait to catch a walleye that falls really fast, 
Um, all the cool things that have been on TV, that have been on tips, that people are winning walleye tournaments on now. I mean, if you would have told somebody that even 10 years ago, they would have laughed at you, you know, mm -hmm. because no, 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 no. We need to use, a, you know, these nice juicy night crawlers. I get my minnows from a secret bait source, you know, all that stuff. It's all misconceptions. And that's part of the reason why I have a lot of fun walleye fishing now. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've, I've always loved walleye fishing. I've, I grew up on it. Like I spent so much time up at Lake of the Woods, you know, pulling spinners and stuff. And, you know, every once in a while we do crankbaits, but you know, I've, I've kind of got a newfound love for walleye now that I really got into, into rip jigging, you know, it's just, it's so different and it's, it's so much more intimate, you know, like you're, you're driving around, you're going slow speeds, trying to go over contours, rock humps, whatever. And, you know, like really picking apart schools and stuff like that. It's just a totally different style of thinking now. And, and guys like you are showing that it's, it's very effective. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, there needs to be a sidebar to that conversation, you know, with the advancements in electronics now, um, you know, when I said I can see 10 walleyes on this sand flat over to my left, um, you know, side imaging is like the biggest advancement in fishing of all time, period. I'll argue that conversation about anything that you name in fishing. Um, what it allows us to do is to accelerate those learning curves on that, you know, how aggressive can I get, change lure, change style, change whatever, because we know we're casting to fish over there. Mm -hmm. So before on 2D sonar, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of guys that have done it before us. You know, I remember seeing a guy in Green Bay using a big, heavy, like little Clio spoon. He's the only guy doing it um, when everyone else was trolling crawlers over the same humps. Um, but like the time is now because we know that the fish are there. And now you can just throw the kitchen sink at them and have way more fun. You don't have any dirt in your boat from night crawlers. You don't have to worry if your minnows are alive or your minnows have, or your leeches have died, or you don't have to pay all that extra money for all the best live bait. You know, um, you know, once a person starts putting in time, they'll inevitably start having confidence, which is the most important in your presentation. And then also success. And like you said, the excitement of it, it's just so much mm -hmm. more fun than, you know, dragging something around with a slip sinker and a five foot leader, you know? Yeah, for sure. I've just, I love artificial baits now, you know, cause like back in the day it was always minnow, leech, cr crawler, whatever. <laughs> but you know, like I, I really got into like ice fishing, doing pan fish, suspended crappies. And you know, and when you're on that school, like you're going to want to use artificial because you want to get down there as fast as possible. You don't want to be re rebating your minnows, but you have to really develop a, you know, confidence level with it. So just one, once you get that confidence with artificial bait, like the sky's the limit for you. Yeah. A hundred percent. Then it's like, you know, if I get ready for a tournament, like we have a tournament coming up here after this event and my, uh, rods that would be used for live bait or even trolling they're like buried on the bottom of my rod locker like all the stuff i want to catch them on is on the top and it'll be a, a sad day this coming week with my tail between my legs if i would have to bust out a minnow or you know a night crawler or anything like that and i'm confident in that you know it's fine like you eventually you know like you said you will get that confidence and when you start having fun doing it then it's like who even cares if i even could have caught 10 more fish today on live bait a, I didn't have to go buy it. B, I didn't care if it was alive or not. And C, I got to like, you know, maybe learn something about an artificial presentation. So it's like, what would I take? 20 walleyes and artificials or 40 on live bait? I'd take 20 every day mm -hmm. for sure. Because you just, you're learning so much yeah. too about it. So cool. Um, what, uh, what sort of presentations and tactics are you doing like this time of year? So it's spring, early summer. What are your favorite types of ways to target walleye? Um, I mean, number one would just be a jig and a plastic. Um, you know, a lot of the early spring fishing, you know, say before Minnesota walleye opener, the Dakotas are obviously open, but, um, you know, as rivers or lakes where the ice just got off. So, you know, number one on that list would be like a nice little supple paddle tail um, on maybe a quarter ounce jig, um, you know, up shallow. Uh, when a river, you know, Obviously, jig fishing is just you kind of pick your weight to what depth you're fishing. Um, so, like a jig and a plastic, number one. Uh, number two would definitely be like casting a crankbait. Um, so, if you are in a river scenario where you can get fish up shallow, um, there's really kind of a fun, 
I've always like ever since that live bait, you know, deal where I re- I can remember the first walleyes I caught trolling a crankbait with my dad, and it was like, holy cow, we caught him on a on a crankbait on a on a floating rappel or whatever, you know, and it mm-hmm. was like way cooler. So for whatever reason, I've always loved casting crankbaits, and the spring is a great time for that because you know inevitably there's going to be fish that are shallow, and you can get you know, a nice subtle bait down to them. Um, you know, say a flicker shad, for instance, you can cast that out. And a lot of like that learning curve with a crankbait, a couple of little key points if you're going to do it is it doesn't really matter the size of that crankbait. You really just need to be, you know, down in their zone. So obviously, you know, touching bottom is a huge trigger. But um, I've learned those lessons in life where you might be catching them on a number five size bait, but that's the bait to use in like, two to three or two to four feet of water. Now, if the fish are out a little deeper, don't worry about that number five. They're still going to eat a number seven, but you just still need to have that kind of same pace of play, still retrieving at the same speed, and you still need to be making some bottom contact. So um, any crankbait that you can make a little bit of bottom contact with um, will catch you a walleye this time of year. So those are definitely like my two favorite things right there. Mm-hmm. So how do you know when, uh, like bottom contact, when it's too much, when it's too much is when you can't turn your reel handle with a little bit of pace to it, you know, a walleye, like we were saying before needs to be triggered. So, um, when you're really crushing bottom and you have to like slow your reel retrieve down or hold your rod tip up, um, then you're hitting bottom too hard. So then you want to go with something that runs shallower. Um, there's a lot of times where, you know, I like to slip drift and a lot of that when casting crankbaits is just to get the longest cast possible. Um, Berkeley 10 pound nano fill is a game changer for that. And basically then you're kind of creating um, like a little miniature trolling pass. If you can cast a number five size bait a mile, now you just rake that whole, you know, hundred feet with a cast from a crankbait. And, um, you know, and if you're ticking bottom periodically, you couldn't troll that any better. Mm-hmm. And, you know, now you can spot lock or you could throw an anchor out if you got on a hot little school or you can just keep moving and do another pass. But um, just just a nice moderate ticking. But think about that speed that, tr- that triggers fish, say 1.5 miles an hour, you know. You can see it. If you have to, like, speed the bait in, that's going to be too fast. So then, boom, step up to something uh, that runs deeper or a little bigger bait that runs deeper and just have that nice pace where you'll just feel it bumping, 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 bumping along instead of just a constant grind. Okay, that makes sense. Um, so we talked about taking the bait away. Um, can you do that on crankbaits too? Um, yeah, for sure. I, you know, it's hard to see. Um, it's hard to visualize that with a, a, a walleye. Are we talking about walleye still? Yeah. Yeah, okay, right. So I've had a lot of very memorable fish catches where I'll feel a walleye bump it. Um, and if you're throwing like a jerk bait, like a cutter, you know, now this is a bait that I'm not trying to hit bottom with. It's just a nice subtle crank bait that I would use early on in the season. It's got a nice little tight wobble and you're really just hoping, you know, that you got the color right and maybe the speed right and adding a pause once in a while will trigger a cold water fish. So I've had it happen a lot of times where I'll feel a fish just bump it. You'll feel a little slack. And what I like to do is just kind of reel it forward and stop it. And then there's that visualization, you know, that fish is looking at it. It's not like it just bumped it and swam away. Like that thing really wants that thing to do something, get away. So I'll reel it forward and then I'll just stop it. And then maybe just like a little twitch or something right back into that visualization of that muskie. And I've actually had some really good tournament bites doing that even, um, you know, late in the year or whatever, but that's kind of one of those little takeaway moves, you know, Visualize that fish, not sold on it. That's why I bumped it. Maybe felt it slap at it. I always just instantly go into musky mode. Maybe I'll reel it forward a little faster and then stop it dead. You know, just some sort of little getaway. Oh, you just nipped me? I, I need to get away here. Three, four feet ahead and stop it and give them a really easy chance. And uh, yeah, you'd be amazed how many bites you get from that. Mm, very cool. So how about, how about some other tactics as the, as the water temperature starts warming up? Is there, is there any other things you like to move into? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think a paddle tail is like probably my favorite walleye lure, especially the last few years. Um, just cause it's such a versatile lure, but, um, 
you know, one of the things I've kind of started doing the last couple of years is just overweighting my jig. Um, we did a really cool episode on the next bite TV and, uh, Gary Parsons flattered me and said, you know, he's like, it's very rare in the fishing industry that you can ever like claim something as your own. You know, there isn't that many opportunities out there anymore, but he's like, I've never heard of somebody doing this. And I was kind of, I knew it was rare to me. I was excited to tell him what, what was going on, you know, but in essence it was using like a three quarter ounce jig head on a champ swimmer, a four and a half inch paddle tail. Now, granted, they got amazing paint jobs that look like perch and bluegills and crappies. So, you know, if you're fishing clear water and I throw that out there, I have confidence that a walleye will bite this. You know, so to, um, when I first started learning that, it was like I'm literally ripping my rod up, you know, out of the weeds and letting the thing free fall. And these walleyes were hitting it as hard as muskies would hit, like a bulldog. And... um so now that's something that I always kind of look for, you know, now this is new water for me, but it will be like my third year, but it really kind of comes into the play with like how fast a glide bait falls, you know, a shiver minnow, a jig wrap, a Johnny dart, they all fall really fast. And that's kind of their trigger is, you know, I think a fish kind of swims up, it sees it darting and weaving. And then as it falls, it's falling really fast. And that in essence is that trigger because it's getting away to the bottom. You know, it's not like that last resort where a muskie's following the bait and it flees back over their head. Instead, I think a lot of the times perch, especially, you know, flee to the bottom. So mm -hmm. number of different presentations, but just stuff that moves faster. Um, same thing with that. Once they came out with the bigger snap jigs, you know, three eights, it was really, really good bait, especially early season in shallow water, like out to like two, four, well, 10 feet of water. But after that, you get so much line in the water that it would just slow down the movement of that bait. Um, so once I came out with a half and three quarter, I started using that right away and I just knew it was going to catch fish. And then sure enough, it did. Um, it was on Mille Lacs at first, but now I've caught them everywhere doing it. But um, now with that three quarter, you know, I can fish that thing out into like 18, 20 feet of water and it's going to move nice and fast. And lo and behold, you might see some guys right next to you catching them on night crawlers and leeches moving at 0.5 miles an hour, but there's times where I guarantee you they could not hold a candle to your catch rate if you're working a bait that fast. There's a lot of times in the early summer and then even into the fall where I guarantee you there isn't a minnow in, on this planet that could outfish one of those fast-moving presentations. Mm -hmm. So what sort of uh, time or water temperature do you start getting comfortable with those fast-moving presentations? Um, well, it starts the first kind of benchmark. It's not really relative to water temp, um, but it's post spawn. So once fish spawn, you know, they want to spawn 42, 44, 46 degree water. Um, once they're done spawning, they're instantly trying to recoup. So you'll see the bigger females will instantly kind of be heading to where they know there's food. Um, it's different on each lake or river, but, um, and then a period after that, I mean, when you start getting into the upper fifties, um, a lot of those fish will start reacting to those presentations. Um, but one of the most important things in water temp, um, I know a lot of people want to use those as like, they're just guidelines. So if the water was like 48 degrees and warming and they already spawned, like if it hit 50 anywhere in this walleye belt, there's a walleye that is in the mood for that. And there's a time where if it's just steady warming, um, that's where I kind of forget the, uh, the actual temperature I'm seeing. And I'll just make some casts out there and try it. And all of a sudden it's like, you get one bite doing that and you just tried five doing something subtle. And then all of a sudden your next 10 casts, you catch four walleyes. Like the, the number of that temperature doesn't mean as much as kind of that trend, that warming. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with that said, say you get into that upper fifties where, yeah, it's, it should be happening. Low sixties for sure. Like 60 to 70 is game on for all that aggressive stuff. Um, you could easily get a cold front one day where, you know, fast moving stuff isn't going to work. Um, or you could just have a gradual warming where you can't even work it aggressive enough. Very cool. All right. Well, that was a ton of 
Really, really great information, John. I appreciate that. Um, so, you know, we're, we're sitting here at Fishing University and, um, you know, you're, you're set to speak here. Uh, you're going to talk about life of a professional angler. So can you just, uh, can you give us a little short version of, of what we're going to hear, what you're going to give to us? Uh, sure. I mean, I've heard that seminar from a number of really, you know, successful bass anglers and, um, so basically what my plan was, I, I don't want to go through the, you know, we did the cliff notes version of how you got into fishing. Um, instead of telling that story, I just want to kind of tell like a real story of, you know, what you don't see, you know, you see somebody having success in a tournament, you see Corey Springle winning a national walleye tour event. And, um, you know, I get a lot of messages on Instagram and on Facebook where, you know, people are asking, Hey, we, you know, asking just for advice of how to do it. And, um, so that's kind of some of the stuff I'll be talking about in the seminar is like, I've fished more hours than most people, maybe 99% of people my age. So there's a thing called a 10,000 hour rule where like, if you do anything for 10,000 hours, you're going to naturally be above a level of anybody who hasn't fished 10,000 hours. So that's one of the kind of the, the key things where there isn't a shortcut to having success on the tournament side um, of fishing. There isn't a shortcut. Um, and then as far as like the whole professional angler part, there's other little, you know, other very important parts of it, but one of them would be social media. So, um, the backstory of how I learned to, you know, maybe be semi entertaining on social media, how to engage a following, you know, I had to Google research, all that stuff. That doesn't just come naturally either. That's even harder work than it is for me to go out fishing, you know, Fishing's easy. I love doing it. I can do it sun up to sundown every day. Social media is the hardest part of my job. So I'm going to kind of talk about that, you know, how I've learned more from Google in the last 10 years of my life than all my schooling combined, you know, just specifically looking like how to engage, um, you know, being able to help the people that are following you, you know, giving them information like the stuff we're going over in our podcast, including that, you know, on a social media post to you know help people catch more fish. Then in turn, you know, you're having cool conversations with them. They're sending you photos, um, you know, how to make that whole work that you do for social media kind of pay back and give you some goosebumps knowing that you're helping people. Um, the other side of it is like um, the guide side of it, you know, like how to be a professional angler. One of the ways would be to be a full-time guide. And I'm just going to kind of go over my, um, my history of, you know, I only ever got up to like part-time guide and, um, you know, that's kind of a blue collar format and just kind of the real version of, you know, what does that look like on a day to day basis? I hope you don't like sleeping because, uh, <laughs> if you do don't become a full-time fishing guide. So, um, that's kind of the, the gist of the seminar. Um, and then I go into a depth a little bit about, you know, what are some of the key mental breakthroughs for myself? Um, to summarize that would be like, you know, you, as an up and coming or as a tournament angler where you're just getting into it, it's a very good idea to try to emulate people that have had success. Again, I'll use Corey's name, um, you know, Keith Gavias, Gary Parsons, um, those guys have had success. So you try to learn as much as you can about those people. Um, I like to even see what they like to eat for dinner. Uh, you know, go to the nth degree of trying to emulate a person that's already had success. So um, I'm going to go over kind of, how I started off that way and then how all of a sudden like my own version of my own interpretation of the conditions and the fish catches and practice and stuff and what my plan was going into the tournament, my own version of what I should do in that tournament all of a sudden led to a national walleye tour win. And that was like a catapult because now I finally was able to justify that what I was thinking about, the research I was doing on the lake, fishing sun up to sundown in practice, just trusting my electronics, all those things, how they have now turned into an actual working recipe for success. So um, cool catapult and confidence. And now I can say going forward, like for the rest of my tournament career, I'm confident that the way I approach pre-fish and the way I think about it and the stuff I observe can lead to winning a tournament. And, um, yeah, that's kind of the last part, but there's a lot of like mental fortitude and, um, really just a, almost a disgusting 
optimism of all of it at all times, you know, it's, uh, you know, starting as a musky fisherman, if I get more than one bite a day, you know, there's some success there. And, uh, I just kind of go over the fact of like being able to stay positive and then segueing that into tournament, like being able to go forward positively in a tournament after plan A, B, C, and D didn't work out. Um, that's what the best tournament fishermen in the world have. And they always have. And once they learn that and they could go forward confidently with their normal process, they call it, you know, then I just went fishing. That's really vague statement. That's not what they're doing. They're going forward and just fishing, but doing it confidently, never getting down, staying positive right up to that last minute. You can have your lines in the water. And that's where you see those guys you know, scrounging up a top 10 or a check or whatever. So um, that's kind of the short version. Well, I'm really looking forward to that. That, that honestly sounds fascinating. The uh, Shields guys are really in for a treat with that. What I, one thing I'm really excited about is actually the social media side of things. Cause that's like, that's what I do as a job on a day to day basis. I'm doing the, the podcast thing. And then on social media, Shields outdoors, Facebook and Instagram. And you know what you're saying is exactly right. Like, and that's, that's kind of what we try to do too. We try to just, you know, it's about the people that are following you. You know, you want to help them. You want to, you know, get them excited about trying new things and just basically getting out, getting out outdoors, whether it be hunting or fishing or camping or, you know, sh- showing your kids new things. So it's, and it's not easy. Like oh. you're right. You know, Google and YouTube are a great resource for that. But um, yeah, it's like trying to be, more interesting than everything else, but still like, you know, providing value to the people, like, you know, you got to give them a reason to, to follow you and stay engaged. Right. For sure. I think Shields does a good job. You know, it's either, uh, entertain or educate. And then obviously entertain and educate is the best scenario. You know, people Mm -hmm. follow people on social media just for entertainment. It's a big part of it. People follow people, uh, pages on social media, you know, to be educated. So, uh, you know, fishing involves a lot of education. Um, I, I always try to ground myself and, um, realize that I take a lot of fishing time. I, I, I take it for granted. You know, I talk about side imaging, 10 fish out there. We lost a lot of people when I said, I see 10 fish in my side imaging out there. Um, but one of the important things is to realize of like, think back to when you first started fishing and be able to like, give people advice on all those different levels, you know? Yeah. Is Corey Sprangle going to, um, benefit from, uh, one of the most basic tips I ever give an angler? No, of course not. But there's a whole array of learning curve along that line of anglers. And it's a beautiful thing, you know, it's mm-hmm. like, Oh my gosh, that reminds me when I got into fishing, asking me about, you know, what's your favorite jig color. It's like, Oh man, I haven't thought about that in years, you know, but, um, you know, so being able to educate on all that different level is kind of a fun thing. And really it kind of represents an unlimited amount of material you can post. Oh yeah, absolutely. And the beauty about social media is like, you never know who you're going to reach. Like you said, it could be the person that's just picking up a rod for the first time or someone that's, you know, do it on a daily basis, but you know, and then just the ability to interact, you know, just if you have a question, you can reach out and you can get an answer back from like that person that's posting the content, which is just, super cool yeah it's fun all right so uh, you know speaking of content uh if uh if people have seen a shields fishing commercial lately they've they've seen you on there so how did how was that whole process uh well that was really fun because the the people that produce those commercials are like crazy talented um and they reached out to me last summer it was like a friend of a friend um called and said, we want to, we want to like get some big walleyes on film. And I was looking at my schedule and I was talking to the guys at, um, sick mana is their company. Um, and I was like, well, I know where to catch big walleyes, you know, (laughs) what time of year. So we ended up on green Bay and I mean, it was like summer peak. So, but you know, when it was done, it was like three days, but getting to like, I've been on TV shows, you know, I'm on the next bite TV and I've been in, around a couple other like production, you know, of videos, commercials and stuff. But these guys, like 
the way that they frame shots and the cinematography of it is like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to see the final product. And as you can see, if you've seen that um, commercial, the short little clips of walleye fishing and stuff, um, I mean, they just make you want to go out and go walleye fishing. I mean, they make me want to go to Shields, buy lures, and go walleye fishing. That's what it does for me. And I got to shoot the video, you know. I was there. <laughs> but, like, when I watch that, it's like, yes, let's go walleye fishing as soon as possible. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I had the same feeling, too, you know, because, like, I mean, being in the marketing department, I could see it, like, months and months in advance of when we're going to release it. And I was like, oh, I can't wait for the day that this gets to hit. Yeah. You know, because, like, you know, it, it first dives into that, you know, that little kid fishing with his, you know, with his parents. And it's just, like, just brings you back to when you started. And then, you know, as it progresses through, just building excitement and excitement. And, yeah, it's just cool. And, and I just, I hope that others feel the same way about it, too. And, like, knowing that you do, too, that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, I'm actually getting goosebumps right now because, I mean, we just covered all that, what we were talking about. And, you know, that's what's being portrayed in that commercial. And it's like that kid just wants to feel that fish tug on his line. He doesn't even know that what's holding his attention span is the same thing that holds my attention span for days now. Mm -hmm. It's holding his attention span for minutes. But, boom, there's a bluegill there's a bass, you know, whatever. And it's just like this awesome progression of, of fishing for sure. Yep. And then just, you know, taking it a level deeper too. Like I have, I have a five-year-old daughter now. Like I felt that emotion like as the kid, but now like to be the parent and to, and to see it through your kid's eyes, like that's, that's something special for sure. Yeah. That's uh, one of my favorite things. I was actually just telling stories about my, um, <clears throat> my friend Paul's son, Waylon, who, you know, we've all met a lot of three, four, five, six-year-olds, and then, you know, some of them stand up, and this kid, all he wants to talk about is fishing. And Paul says, I created a monster. I bought him into <laughs> Shields, and I bought him a lure, and I told him the next time he can get one lure only each time. So now he's, like, trying to manipulate his dad into going into the store, like, weekly, you know, multiple times a week because he knows he gets one lure, and he, he knows all their names and everything. So, I mean, yeah, there's nothing more pure than, like, watching a kid who's already into fishing that much. I'm sure it was just like you and I when we were that age, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just do not pull me off the water. We're fishing. I want to fish. Oh, that's it. it sounds like we got to get that kid in a, in a Shield social media, media video oh, sometime. My. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that would be, yeah, that would go viral for sure. If you can just get him talking, it's unbelievable. Oh, love it. Yeah, just the things kids say. Yep. So great. Oh, all right. Well, you know what, John, thank you so much for your time. It's been, you know, super informative, like just the chasing the baits and, and all your tactics and strategies and entertaining at the same time too. It's been, it's been good. And I'm definitely looking forward to your, to your segment. Now I'm nervous for the seminar. <laughs> You'd be all right. Yeah, I think so. Okay. Thanks again. Thank you. You just heard our conversation with professional angler John Hoyer at his Shields Fishing University held in Chamberlain, South Dakota. This is going to be a super fun week, and I'm going to be going through this training, also bringing a camera along to try and capture as much of that content as possible, which you're going to be able to see upcoming on our Shields Outdoors Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube channels. We also filmed another podcast segment, which was hinted at here in this podcast, which was with professional anglers Corey Sprengel and Mark Quartz. Stay tuned for that one in an upcoming segment. And with that, we want to thank you all for listening and see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Shields Outdoors podcast. Stay tuned for future segments and visit our social media pages, Shields Outdoors on Facebook and Instagram for daily updates.